Hi folks, welcome back to ECMATH. Today, this is the third video in our series on inverse trig, and I'm going to use this to explore graphically what the graphs of the three inverse trig functions look like. I'm on my other computer. I'm not going to draw. I'm going to use some Desmos here. So um, if you've seen the graph of sine inverse, which is what we'll start with, you might have seen in your book that it looks like this. This is a weird little squiggly thing floating off in space. If you zoom out, there's no other graph hanging around. It's, that seems to be just it. So I thought we'd take some time and explore why that graph looks the way it does. So we'll start with a graph of y equals sine of x. You can see all my functions over here. These are all kind of prepared for later. Um, and sine of x looks like we would expect it to. It goes up to 1, down to minus 1. I'm actually going to try to see if I can get those. Uh, up to 1, down to minus 1 and oscillates in all the ways that you would expect it to. Now I want to do something cool that only Desmos can do. I've never seen this on your calculator. When you create an inverse function, if you were to create that function, your first move would be to switch x and y. So what if I type in x equals sine of y? That's technically going to make the inverse function uh, for sine. And here it is. So this is the inverse function for sine. Now, you might be looking at this and saying, Mr. Eck, how can this be an inverse function? It fails the vertical line test, so it can't be a function. Um, and in fact, that's true. This is a very bad version of the inverse function um, because it's not a function. So this is just switching x with y. Uh, Desmos is happy to graph because it's a cool graphing software. It's happy to graph things that are not functions for you, but it's not going to be a function that we can use on, for example, our calculator or when we're going to use more work on paper. What I like about this is you can see the relationship between the function and its inverse and how uh, the function is reflected over the line y equals x. Even if uh, this inverse function is not a function, you can still reflect it over the line, that line y equals x. So for this thing to be a function, we're going to have to have a way to restrict the uh, outputs so that the thing makes a function. And what I'm actually going to do is create a restriction on the sine of x before it's reflected so that the sine of x is one to one. That is, uh, if you remember right, turn things on. A function was defined as having an inverse if it passed what we called the horizontal, oops, not that, horizontal line test. So, for example, there's a horizontal line. This graph passes it many times. Uh, which in theory means that this function in red here does not have an inverse. That's well defined. And yet, of course, we know that sine inverse exists, so what the heck are we going to do? Well, if we ever have a function that fails that horizontal line test, I'll turn it back on, um, what we can do is restrict that function. So I'm going to make an inequality that says a, uh, the sine x is only going to exist from two numbers a to b. And I'm just uh, going to randomly select a and b. I've actually made sliders for a and b, so what I can do so you'll notice I'm still failing the horizontal line test. I'm going to turn off the horizontal line for simplicity. But you can imagine that this is failing that test and at any point. So let me turn that on and off to just check for my error doubt. So what I'm going to do is slide this function around until I get the left end, which is determined by A, and the right end, which is determined by B, to give me a piece of the function that only uh, is increasing. So even if I cut the function off like this, this is a pretty small little cut of this function, still fails a horizontal line test because I touched this at more than one spot. And if this is at a different line, like let's, uh, if that was at a different value, then you would still fail the test. You can imagine that any time this function curves around, I'm failing this horizontal line test. So it seems like I'm going to have to, on the left side, clip this function off at a point such that it is at its maximum. It's no longer increasing or decreasing. And on the other side, on the right, I'm going to have to clip this function off here. I could, I guess, clip the function off less and pass the horizontal line test. I could clip my function really small, but then I'm not really like creating a very useful function. I want to create as large a function as possible so that I can like use it to find inverse trig and, and do values with it. This seems like the largest possible cut of this function that will also let me 
um, past the horizontal line test. If I go any further out, I start to curve around. So we're going to stop right there. I'm also going to do something pretty sneaky, uh, which is I'm going to take the same restriction, A, X is between A and B, and for the inverse graph, I want to give it the restriction uh, Y is between those same values A and B. Oh. So here's what happens then. If I zoom uh, in and out, I'm going to reset my A and B, and you can see that uh, sine of X is not one to one, and the inverse function is not a function at all. But as I crawl A up, I'm kind of losing either the left or the bottom side of the graph, and as soon as I stop at pi over 2, negative pi over 2, then the red function is now going to be 1 to 1, at least on this, this side. And let's crawl B back to the other side. You notice that the red function is also uh, 1 to 1. Now the red function passes the horizontal line test, and the purple function is a function again. And if I were to make ooh, A be any bigger, uh, oh, sorry, a is, a is this lower one. If I were to make A be any smaller, I'm now no longer a function. I'm failing the vertical line test. Uh, and you can see where these kind of limiting values are. It happens, seems to be happening right around, uh, I have to turn the sine graph back on, right around negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. If you remember from our previous videos, if you've watched them, then you know that sine inverse of x only exists or only has outputs from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. And we talked about the quadrants and why that reasoning makes sense in the other video. This is the graphical reasoning why that makes sense, is that if you were to extend your graph any further outside of those quadrants, you're no longer passing the horizontal line test, so your inverse is no longer a function. Now, the last thing I want to show you here, uh, so we've already kind of seen what the sine inverse should look like. What if I just type in y equals sine inverse of x? Desmos is smart enough to understand that. Here it is. Now you'll notice something a little weird is that this isn't really lining up. Ah, I'm going to highlight that point. This isn't really lining up on the axis because I switched x and y. And my axes were scaled to graph a sine graph, where the x-axis is radian angles and the y-axis is numbers, uh, integers. So if I switch those numbers, all of a sudden, my x-axis should be scaled to integers, and my y-axis should be scaled to radians. So if I switch to my other graph over here, you can notice, projector mode, yeah, you can actually notice that, that my, uh, when I scale my y-axis and radians, and my x-axis and integers, because I'm doing the inverse function now, uh, this graph lines up really nicely with those lattice points on the graph. And this is your graph of sine inverse of x. Its lowest point is negative 1 comma negative pi over 2. It increases up through the point 0, 0 because sine inverse of 0 is 0. And it goes up to the point 1 comma pi over 2 because the sine inverse of 1, the angle that has sine 1, is pi over 2. So this is the graph of sine inverse of x. Let's repeat this game for cosine of x. So here's our nice graph of cosine x. I'm going to keep the a and b bounds because I'm about to use them. Notice again that this is not one to one. It fails the horizontal line test. When I switch x with y, so x equals cosine y, I get a piece of function that definitely is not a function at all, fails the vertical line test in pretty much every single way. Uh, but you can notice that these are still reflections over the line y equals x. It's actually even easier to see the reflective property. Um, that these are reflections of each other, which I think is pretty cool. That's always true with inverse functions. Um, so let's see, though. Let me turn off that inverse. Let's slide our left and right ends in and out in such a way that we're going to obey the horizontal line test. Now let's say that I tried to go to negative pi over 2 and slide there. Pi over 2, like before. That's what I had for sine. Well, guess what? This piece of the function does not pass the horizontal line test. If I create the inverse, it's not a function. So what you might, so what we're going to have to do is extend this function out a little more to get all the function. We're also going to have to increase the cut on the other side. So this is what we're going to end up doing to make a chunk of cosine x that is one to one. Let me see if I can show you a little more specifically what 
were cutting, right? So notice if I went any further on the left or any further on the right, I would start to curve back around and I would fail that horizontal line test. I could have, there's another, a mathematical world where we choose this left half, which would correspond with quadrants negative pi to zero, so quadrants three and four. But it would just be weird to omit quadrant one. Quadrant one seems like the best quadrant, so we're going to keep that quadrant. And uh, I'm going to redo this cut, and we'll keep it that way. I'll turn off cosine. So this is our, our restricted graph of cosine. It's restricted to go from zero to pi only. Restricted inputs from zero to pi, which means when we flip this and give x equals cosine y, I should have restricted outputs from 0 to pi. And look at this. I do. I have restricted outputs starting at 0, trace, 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 ending at pi, 3.14. So uh, I've switched the restriction of the inputs and the outputs. And this graph in purple is actually the graph of cosine inverse x. And let's see what happens if I go to Desmos and say, give me the graph of cosine inverse x. What does that look like? It looks like what we predicted. It looks like the graph that we created earlier. And just to show you guys again, since we'd switched the axes, this is actually now scaled wrong. This is not 1, 0. Um, so on the proper scale, you can notice really how cosine inverse of x behaves. We'll turn off sine for a second. Starts at the point 1, 0. Travels up through 0, comma pi over 2. Why does it go through there? because the inverse cosine of zero, that is what angle has cosine zero? Well, pi over two has cosine zero, right? Right up in the, in the uh, middle of the first and second quadrants. And then we travel through quadrant two, um, pi over two up to pi, and we end up at the point negative one comma pi, because what's the cosine of negative one? Uh, what's the cosine of pi is negative one. What angle has cosine equal to negative one? The angle of pi. So this is the graph of cosine inverse x. Let's do this one more time, folks. We have one more graph, and it is tangent inverse. Tangent inverse is the one that students always love because the graph is pretty bananas when you start throwing all these uh, other reflections and shifts on there. So here's a graph of tangent x. Uh, if you remember right, it has asymptotes at negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. And then every other uh, multiple of pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, 5 pi over 2, it would have asymptotes. I still have it cut off from uh, negative 2 pi to 2 pi, which is why you don't see it extending out there. But it would extend infinitely out. Uh, now let's switch x and y. So here, this is y equals tangent x. Let's draw x equals tangent y. By this point, you probably know what's going to happen. It's going to reflect over this line y equals x. Oh my gosh, there it is. So this is the graph of tangent inverse. But obviously, this is not a very good function. We want our graph of tangent inverse to be a function. So we're going to have to restrict our graph of tangent. Okay, uh, just to show you, here's the reflection. Here's the y equals x line. You can see how tangent x and uh, the reflection of it are really reflections. You switch x with y. Um, this creates the inverse, but it's just not a function yet. So now let's look at tangent x. We need to restrict it to a function uh, where it's one-to-one. -one. That is, it uh, passes the horizontal line test. Well, this thing has a lot of different branches. So what if we just took the center branch of this function? I believe that's negative pi over 2. And we'll just cut off all the other branches and just take the center branch of that function. Just the pi over 2's positive to negative. That's it. What happens if we reflect just this piece? Now we get a graph that it still has an infinite domain, but it has a restricted range. Its domain is anything, which we actually talked about when we talked about the inverse tangent function. We said you can input any sort of number into inverse tangent because tangents opposite over adjacent. You can have side lengths as long or short as you want um, to, and still produce valid tangent ratios, unlike sine or cosine. So this is what the graph is. If we go and say, hey, Desmos, what's the graph of tangent inverse? Give it a different color. Same graph. Uh, this one especially a little hard to read. So remember that our scale here is wrong on this graph because we should have the integer scale on the x-axis and the radian scale on the y-axis when we switch x with y. So let's see what that looks like. 
There's your tangent inverse x graph. I'll turn off cosine for a second. And just to show, well, you can really see it here. Um, you can see that though uh, plus and minus pi over 2 lines are functioning as vertical asymptotes of the graph because they were horizontal asymptotes of the previous tangent graph. So you can really see how this graph is restricted in range by the asymptotes, even though it has that infinite looking domain. So this is a really cool kind of graph. I think the graph of inverse tangent shows up a lot in, you know, later on in math, just because it's another graph, kind of like the logistic growth, where you have two asymptotes, your end behavior to the left and right is a little bit different. Um, and you have this nice, interesting growth in between. So it's just a very interesting function to look at the graph of. Uh, and so what do we need to know about inverse tangent? Infinite domain, range from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, graph as a reflection of one piece of tangent. So just to recap, I'm going to stay on this graph here. Sine inverse goes, uh, has a input value from negative 1 to 1, and an output value from negative pi over 2 up to pi over 2. That's quadrants 4 and 1. Quadrant 4, quadrant 1. Cosine inverse. Uh, input values from negative 1 to 1. Output values from 0 up to pi. 0 up to pi. Output values. Those output values then are quadrants 1 and 2. Quadrants 1 and 2. And tangent inverse. Tangent inverse, unrestricted inputs, put anything you want in there, output values, negative pi over 2 up to positive pi over 2, negative, that's quadrant 4, quadrant 1, quadrant 4, quadrant 1. And so these graphs, hopefully I'll put them all to close the video, put them all in one spot here. These are the three graphs, and this is another way, if you didn't like my explanation about quadrants, this is another way to think about why the trig inverse graphs are the way they are, and um, hopefully to understand the restrictions on them when you start graphing them. So that's it. Oh, you enjoyed this video. Uh, this trig inverse stuff is really tricky. There's a lot. There is a lot. It's multiple, you know, kind of like hour-long blocks of class usually when we talk about it. Um, and you know, it takes it takes some work to to really understand. So if you're not understanding it all right away, you're probably in the right spot. That's a good place to be. But just keep doing your problems, ask those questions, talk to your peers, talk to me, uh, get the help you need. But, you know, once you understand all this trig inverse stuff, it's going to be really helpful. And if you take the time now, you won't have to be afraid of it in the future. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I will see you all next time.